Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert, coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. A panel of federal judges declared North Carolina's congressional districts to be unconstitutional last Tuesday. According to the judges, the district maps are drawn in an extremely partisan way, designed to give Republicans practically permanent advantage in races for the U.S. House of Representatives. Back in 2016, when the North Carolina legislature last redrew its district maps, Republican state lawmaker David Lewis reportedly even said, quote, I propose that we draw the maps to give a partisan advantage to 10 Republicans and three Democrats because I do not believe that it's possible to draw a map with 11 Republicans and two Democrats. The judge's decision, written by Judge James Wynn Jr., cited a 1969 court decision saying, quote, on its most fundamental level, partisan gerrymandering violates the core principle of Republican government that, rep that voters should choose their representatives, not the other way around. Joining me now from Los Angeles to discuss the judge's decision is Dan Vicuña. Dan is a national redistricting manager for Common Cause, one of the main plaintiffs in this case. Thanks for being here, Dan. Thanks so much for having me. So give us, first of all, a brief summary of the decision. What exactly is unconstitutional about North Car uh, Carolina's congressional districts and why? Sure. Well, just a, a short bit of background. You know, the North Carolina legislature uh, first you drew this you drew a congressional map after the last census, tw after the 2010 census, and two of their congressional districts were struck down as an illegal racial gerrymander. The court said, "You've packed African American voters into just a couple of districts in a way that um, eliminates their ability to to affect the map, uh, to affect any other surrounding districts." And that was very intentional as a way of giving the Republicans an advantage in the state. Um, what the court then ordered them to do in 2016 uh, was to redraw redraw districts. And that's where the quote you mentioned came from. Um, the legislature said uh, very publicly, um, look, this is not going to be any kind of racial gerrymander. What we're going to do is draw these districts to ensure that Republicans maintain control of 10 of 13 seats in our congressional delegation, despite the fact that the state is basically evenly split between the parties. Um, and so common cause. Um, and we were joined uh, by the North Carolina Democratic Party and some individual voters in the state. Um, we said that's got to be, you know, that is a clear case of uh, an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. So, so we sued um, on the grounds that this violated the, the First Amendment rights of those targeted voters because they were targeted because of their speech, because of their support for Democratic candidates. Um, we said this is an equal protection violation, you know, again, mistreating uh, Democratic voters. Um, uh, in an invidious manner, and a couple of other constitutional provisions related to the way that uh, the popular election of the House of Representatives members, you know, saying that you know, this goes far beyond the state's power um, to uh, to to regulate elections, the time, place, and manner of elections. This is actually dictating outcomes. Um, it also violates provision of the Constitution, and which states that the House of Representative members must be elected by the people. Um, basically, a lot of these members of Congress are being elected. Uh, by legislators, um, these districts were predetermined, um, sort of in the in the drawing of districts. Um, so that was our constitutional challenge. Um, and uh, uh, several weeks after we filed our case, um, the League of Women Voters, um, represented by Southern Coalition for Social Justice and Campaign Legal Center, um, filed a separate lawsuit on slightly different grounds, using some slightly different constitutional provisions. Um, fortunately, we really won on all counts. Um, the the three-judge panel, you know, again, represented by uh, uh, an Obama appointee, a George W. Bush appointee, and a Jimmy Carter appointee, um, unanimously, unanimously stated that this was a clear violation of fundamental constitutional rights um, of the public. Um, two of the judges um, agreed that this was both a First Amendment and uh, equal protection violation, um, along with those other um, popular election uh, provisions I mentioned. Um, the third, the D George W. Bush appointee, said that this was um, only a violation um, along uh, the postcard related to those popular election article one sections. But in the end, um, it was a, a sweeping victory. Um, you know, for the, the way these cases work, they have sort of an unusual route um, through the court system. Uh, they go straight from a three judge panel. North Carolina legislature has already stated that they will be appealing the decision. And this will go straight to the US Supreme Court, um, which we imagine a decision could, um, oral arguments could happen within a year. But in the meantime, uh, the trial court has ordered the North Carolina legislature to redraw districts um, and recognizing the likely possibility that this legislature, which has again and again violated the constitutional rights of North Carolinians, um, that they cannot do the job 
it's also going to hire its own map drawer um, to do um, some alter an alternative remedial map to make sure that the people of North Carolina get fair representation. So <clears throat> what is the larger significance, though, of this decision? It's not a Supreme Court decision, but do you expect uh, that it will have an impact beyond North Carolina and other states where gerrymandering is blatantly partisan? I do. I, I think this is part of a, a recognition um, both among activists um, all the way up to the judiciary that you're not seeing your grandfather's gerrymanders anymore. This isn't a time when, you know, maybe both parties got together and they were drawing on paper maps on the ground and making an educated guess as to how they could protect both parties' incumbents. This has become uh, something that can be done with incredible scientific precision, um, using big data, um, consumer information, and combining that with voter histories. You can fairly accurately predetermine the, the drawing, who's going to win in a given district, basically for the entire decade. And so what we're seeing is that the judiciary is recognizing that you, you can't, certainly can't rely on self-interested politicians to do something about this. Um, you know, it, it's absurd to think that they're going to reform themselves. So they're starting to act. Um, this is the, you know, the, the Supreme Court has already stated in very recent cases that partisan gerrymanders are incompatible with democratic principles. They heard the Gilvey Whitford case in October, which we're waiting for a decision on. Um, in, in a surprise move, they agreed to hear a case, a Democratic gerrymander out of Maryland, which strongly suggests they may want to decide the Republican and Democratic gerrymanders together, um, and finally set a standard, an outward bound, um, you know, for stating that partisan gerrymandering is, unco gerrymandering is unconstitutional. And this North Carolina case is, you know, is a, a recognition. Uh, that I think, think led by the Supreme Court's recent actions, a recognition by the judiciary that something's got to be done, that this is an assault on basic democratic rights, um, the likes of which we haven't seen before. And so if uh, the North Carolina case is somehow joined with these cases the court um, is going to decide on shortly, um, or you know it's decided shortly after, you know we're very likely in 2018 to see significant action um, at the very highest levels of our court uh, to stem um, or, or partisan gerrymandering. So it's it's a really exciting development. Um, and um, yeah, we look forward to, uh, you know, sort of again, providing fair representation to all Americans. Okay, well, you, you've kind of addressed my next question already, but I just wanted to kind of reemphasize that gen gerrymandering has been an issue practically since the country's founding. Uh, actually, the, the word gerrymandering has its origins in 1812, when Massachusetts Governor Jerry created a congressional map that resemb resembled a salamander. But uh, just how serious now is the problem, would you say, or how's it become? Is partisan gerrymandering, in other words, um, in, uh, worse now than it has been in the past? And I think you've already kind of answered that question, but uh, are we getting any closer now to resolving this problem once and for all? I mean, do you expect the Supreme Court, given that it's probably going to have a conservative majority, to uh, to really reform this? So just to fill in a little bit more of what I, what I mentioned, of sort of how things have changed, we have seen um, social scientists who use various, you know, there are a lot of creative, um, interesting measures out there to determine um, uh, how bad a gerrymander is. and. You know, it's not only sort of what I discussed about kind of the, the use of big data and combining it with voting histories and really, um, you know, kind of using scientific precision. We also know on the back end, you know, the social scientists are looking at the results of elections and and the way districts are drawn and seeing that, in fact, very the most recent gerrymanders, you know, especially districts that were redrawn after the 2010 census are, in fact, historically worse um, by far than than going decades back when, you know, when we thought those were bad gerrymanders. So there is a definitely a significant difference um, in 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 how rigged um, elections are becoming. Um, and uh, you know, I think in terms of the Supreme Court's likelihood of action, um, as usual, you know, the big question mark is Justice Kennedy. I think in oral arguments for Gilby Whitford, um, the four uh, sort of left-leaning judges of those that were appointed by Democrats seemed open to the idea that it's time to act on this. That this is an, uh, that gerrymandering is a clear assault on democratic freedoms, um, and that the judiciary it, it was a worthwhile enterprise to try to determine a workable judicial standard to do something. Um, Justice Kennedy had some some tough questions, um, I think, for Wisconsin and those defending the Wisconsin gerrymandering. And he 
uh, you, who you asked specifically uh, a, a hypothetical which fits perfectly with the North Carolina case we just won, which was, you know, he asked, um, would a map be unconstitutional if the legislature wrote in law that there had to be discrimination against one party? Um, and he got the attorney representing the Wisconsin legislature to concede that that would, in fact, likely be a First Amendment violation. Well, that's exactly what we see in North Carolina, um, where the, the legislature made partisan advantage a specific criteria of the drawing of districts. And so we think that, uh, you know, the North Carolina case fits perfectly with the direction in which Justice Kennedy, the swing vote on the court, um, is looking to go. Um, we think that, but, he, but possibly even before he gets to our North Carolina case, um, I, I think the, the questions he asked, um, the concern he demonstrated, um, both in the oral arguments for Gill and a previous decision where he signed on to the idea that partisan gerrymandering um, is contradictory to democratic rights. Um, I, I think he is, he's gettable. I, I, I can't imagine that he wants um, his legacy to be um, providing, uh, you know, kind of a, a stamp of approval um, for gerrymandering, but um, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Okay, well, we'll definitely come back to you once we uh, get a further development in this case. I was speaking to Dan Vicuña, National Redistricting Manager for Common Cause. Thanks again, Dan, for having joined us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.